Welcome, everyone. My name is Anne Nagjma Boussa. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. Um, and together with the Center for European Studies, we're delighted to welcome today Giovanni Capoccia to the Distinguished Lecture Series. Giovanni is a professor of comparative politics at the University of Oxford and a fellow of Corpus Christi College. Um, and he really represents the cutting edge of comparative political science research because he re-examines re how the history of European autocracy and democratization holds lessons for other regions and other places. And in doing so, he really mines some um, archival research that has until now never really been um, examined. And in his first book, Defending Democracy, he examined how democratic regimes dealt with the sort of ironic threat, right? Extremist parties who would basically undercut democracy were they ever to get into power. Um, and so this response basically forms the, the core of the book. And this wonderful book won the best book award in European politics given out by the American Political Science Association. Um, in a new co-edited volume of Daniel Ziblatt, he recast the study of the emergence of democratic institutions in, the, in Europe in the 19th and 20th century. Rather than one single democratization process, um, the authors argue that there are multiple democratization processes that happen across different times and across different domains. It's a much more fragmented view of democ democratization. And he's also done some very exciting work on the dynamics of institutional change and reassessing electoral institutions. And the American Political Science Association has recognized this pathbreaking award with no less than four different awards, um, as well as the Best Book Award. For those who of you who are inclined quantitatively, that's an average of one award a year for the last, pi for the last five years, which is very impressive indeed. <laughs> so today we're extremely pleased to welcome Professor Capoccia, who will today speak on setting the boundaries of participation in post-authoritarian Europe. Lessons, oh sorry, in post-authoritarian democracies. Lessons from post-war Europe. Welcome. Thank, thanks very much, Anna. Thanks for the very kind introduction. And thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm very pleased um, to, to be here. And so, um, as Anna said today, I'm going to deal with the following question. Um, successive parties, um, and by that, I mean parties that perpetuate uh, the ideas, the values, the platforms, and in the first steps, uh, even the personnel, of defunct authoritarian regimes exist in all post-authoritarian democracies. Successive parties, so parties that perpetuate authoritarian values and sometimes personnel, uh, exist in all post-authoritarian democracies. And yet, uh, they are treated very differently. So the policy regimes that you find in post-authoritarian democracies vis-a-vis -vis successive parties are uh, range from um, very tight legal restrictions, that is to say in some cases these parties try to reform but they're prosecuted, they're targeted with legal actions, they're brought to court, they're dissolved, they're forcibly illegalized, their members are sort of threatened with legal, personal legal actions and so on, down to the other extremes in which they are treated exactly like every other party um, that I call lenient, uh, lenient policy regime. And my question really in this uh, paper, but also in my broader research, is why? What explains this, this variation? This seems to me an important question for social scientists to, to ask, for at least three reasons. First of all, it's a very important normative dilemma of democracy. That is to say, um, democratic well, political philosophers of democracy and of liberalism, at least since John Stuart Mill, but even today, uh, more recently with John Rawls, or today with Stephen Holmes and others, Nancy Rose, Rosenblum and so on, have um, dealt with this dilemma of how much freedom for the enemies of freedom. What, is, what should Democrats do when faced with a political opinion or even a political movement that uh, denies the fundamentals of democracy? Is the microphone going to be fixed? No, okay. <laughs> um, so no, that's okay. Um, so uh, it seems to me that knowing how this dilemma is solved in the practice of politics, of democratic politics, is important for comparative political scientists. Also, a second reason has to do more directly with comparative politics. And it seems to me that uh, this question is important because it complements democratization studies. Democratization studies deal with issues like lustration or trans, uh, transitional justice, where some of the dilemma that these questions highlight and, and tackles are uh, analyzed in the practice of politics. Why is there 
transitional justice of some kind or not in post authoritarian democracy, uh, the typical question, why is the illustration and so on. So it seems to me that dealing with um, authoritarian organizations as opposed to authoritarian or suspected authoritarian individuals is at least as important. Um, and therefore, we should uh, analyze this question systematically. The third reason is that in scatter studies in political science, these um, policy regimes have been assumed or having shown to have important consequences for democratic stability, for democratic identity, for um, party politics, and so on. But again, we may know what the consequences are, but we don't know what the causes are of this, of this policy regimes. So how is this question answered in, um, in the literature? The literature is very big and very diverse, but really can be summarized in that first line up there. Policy variation is driven by public norms. So this takes three different incarnations. Um, some classics of European political science like Karl Joachim Friedrich or Otto Kirchheimer um, say that the different policies that um, Western, generally West European democracies at that time uh, show um, a display vis-a-vis -vis authoritarian parties are a function of political culture. So if a country has a tolerant political culture like Britain or you know, the US or and so on, then these policies will tend to be lenient. Well, if a country is less tolerant, like, guess who, Germany, uh, <laughs> uh, these policies will tend to be more on the restrictive end of the spectrum. Another uh, tradition of literature has to do with legal tradition or legal cultures, as they are called sometimes. And again, uh, these are mainly constitutional lawyers or uh, philosophers of law that, um, that maintain that this variation on how uh, successor parties or extremist parties in general are treated in democratic systems has to do really with how the constitutional debate traditionally has developed in a certain country. And the third one uh, that is um, a very large one and the most relevant uh, to the talk today, although the other two are relevant too, has to do with the politics of memory. There is a huge literature, especially in Western Europe, but also in Eastern Europe and other areas of the world, that says that basically decisions about how to treat successor parties are a function of learning lessons from the past. This is the typical um, uh, metaphor that is used in this literature. Um, depending on what lessons elites learn from the new democratic elites, learn from their past, they are going to enact different policies against parties and movements that represent that past. Um, I am going to take issue especially with this last um, um, strand of literature. Um, let me just quote another metaphor that's been recently used by an important constitutional lawyer, Andre, Andras Shayo. Um, Post-authoritarian democracy have constitutional risk aversion, uh, <laughs> which means, uh, according to him, that they have been burned in the past and therefore they tend to pass these restrictive norms and to enact them as soon as they see the minimum sign of uh, extremist activity. Risk aversion is, a, is an expression, is a concept uh, drawn from behavioral psychology. They tend to over, overestimate small probability. That's, that's what he's referring to. Um, this doesn't really explain the variation that we that we've seen, but I thought that there was at least an innovation on the, on the level of the metaphors that I used uh, in this kind of literature. So the problems with these accounts, all of them really, is that despite their continuous reference to history, they are, in essence, ahistorical. For the three reasons that I, that I put down there. They ignore strategic interaction leading to policy selection. And that strikes me as weird, as strange, because these are policies that tend to exclude or allow a political party from competition. 
And so it's strange that the other parties don't take a view on this, and it's strange that the other parties won't have different views on whether this should be done or not. And it would be strange if these different views were not driven somewhat by somehow by partisan objectives. The second um, thing is the, um, uh, the second reason why I think these accounts are, are historical is that they simply assume this direction of causality. They say, well, it's public norms, it's public frameworks of normative frameworks that have to do with memory, that have to do with legal culture, that lead to the adoption of a certain <coughs> policy. And they never test the possibility that it might be the other way around, and yet we have literature in historical institutionalism, in policy studies, that shows that in some cases at least, passing major policies, uh, approving major policies, might change public views. Um, interpretive schemes of the world. And so this is, however, a direction of causality that is never tested in this literature. Um, the third thing, uh, the third reason um, why these accounts are, are historical is that they seem to assume homogeneous causality over time. That is to say, it doesn't really matter when you observe this connection between policies and norms, it's always going to be the same. And again, also here, we have uh, large traditions of, um, of uh, studies that show that it's so often unwise, especially when we look at policies, to assume that causality always work in the same way, uh, no matter when you observe the phenomenon. Um, so what they really talk about, this, uh, these accounts, is the association between these two, these two factors, between some public prevalence of certain norms or certain normative framework about memory or about legal culture and the, the existence of certain policies. But they don't really do a good job of saying what causes what and what comes first. And so I contend that if we want to do that, want to do exactly that, that is to say explain what causes what, we need to put strategic interaction at the center of our analysis. We need to uh, test different uh, possible causal directions, and we need to uh, deal with the fact that sometimes causality is not homogeneous over time. And so this is my argument, to put it in one slide. Uh, first of all, we have to distinguish between the aftermath of transition, which I define, broadly speaking, as the period after the first founding elections in a new democracy, and uh, the sub subsequent elections, or successive parliamentary elections, or between the first and the second, roughly speaking, um, democratic political elections, and a later period in which you may well have feedback effects and policy entrench entrenchment. What I'm going to concentrate on today is really the first, um, the first half of these arguments, so to speak, because it seems to me that that's the, the point that logically has to be made first in order to correct or, or integrate or criticize the existing conventional uh, views on this matter. And I'm going to, um, to make two points here. First, that really the selection of a policy is, co is caused by electoral incentives of political parties and other decision makers. And second, that in, in fact, rather than being caused by inclinations on memory of the authoritarian past, the policy causes or has an impact on the public debate on the memory of the, author the authoritarian past. So um, this is what really I'm going to argue in this talk. So let me move to the, to the first of these two points. Electoral incentives of decision making, decision makers, sorry, explain policy variation. These incentives uh, are, as I hope to show, distinguishable and often at odds with um, inclinations of the same forces, the same political forces towards the authoritarian past. What are electoral in incentives? So actually. Should we say, is there anything systematic that we can look at that shapes the electoral incentives in the aftermath of a democratic transition? And I um, have come up with, different, with three different factors 
that shape these incentives vis-a-vis -vis the adoption of restrictive or lenient policies towards successor parties. And let me tell you something about these three pathways. I call them modern transition, party competition, and pro-authoritarian groups. So these are really short labels uh, for uh, what they actually are. The first pathway depends on the events of the transition, and in particular on whether the previously dominant authoritarian party manages to carry over in the new regime sufficient organizational resources. And here, roughly speaking, you can distinguish between negotiated transitions where the party in question manages to do that, and what I call rupture transitions, for want of a better, of a better word, in which instead um, mem the, the organizational structures and resources of the previously dominant authoritarian party are requisitioned, uh, these members are jailed or even killed or go out of politics, so the party is basically disintegrated and dissolved. Um, if we are in presence of a negotiated transition, then there is no choice of policy. The policy towards the successor party is going to be lenient. There is no option there. The option is out of the table, off the table. If we instead we have a rupturous transition, the option is open to uh, democratic incumbents. And whether they will uh, um, opt for a restrictive policy versus a lenient policy depends on well the other two pathways, the first of one, the first of which I call party competition. That is to say, again to specify this very general label, mainly whether the successor party that is reformed after this uh, disruption and this dissolution and this uh, um, uh, um, you know, forced disbandment that it undergoes as a consequence of the transition, but this reformed successor party threatens the electoral, the, the governing majority. If it threatens the governing majority electorally, then it's likely that the governing majority will exploit the situation of discredit that this party has in the aftermath of the transition and resort to restrictive policies and even illegalization or forced disbandment. If it doesn't, well, then it's likely that the opposite will happen. That is to say that a more default lenient position will be adopted because really nobody, nobody cares. Nobody wants to go um, through the trouble to um, adopt restrictive uh, policies and even illegalization. Um, let me add one thing to this point. Um, imagine that there's a left-right space, for simplicity, a monodimensional space. Imagine that the previous regime is a right-wing authoritarian regime, and it generates, therefore, a successor party that is on the extreme right. Now, the parties, imagine now that there's a governing majority of the center right, and therefore that there is this threat, okay? Now, the governing majority would have perhaps a more accommodating view of the past regime than the opposition, which is farther away ideologically from the successor party. And yet, electorally, it would be the most threatened among the actors in, uh, in the party spectrum. That is to say, often it is the case that the parties that are closest ideologically to the successor party are, and therefore have, um, a more accommodating view of the, uh, the fascist past, or the authoritarian past in general, will also be the more threatened, um, electorally speaking. Why is that? Because these parties generally are those that want more than any other parties reattract the individuals that supported the regime. And therefore, they will make um, gestures of openness towards these individuals and say, you know, please vote for us, we'll forget everything. But as soon as a successor party, a competing organization for the same votes come up, they are threatened by it and therefore they would be inclined to take restrictive, restrictive policies towards that. So um, 
Obviously, if instead you have a government that is somewhat in the opposition, uh, in the, in the, sorry, not in the opposition, in the more distant part of the political spectrum, a different dynamic will, will apply. Therefore, they would encourage a lenient <laughs> policy because that splits their mainstream political, um, political adversaries. Third uh, point, third pathway, pro-authoritarian groups. This simply comes from, the, from, the, uh, from noting that in the aftermath of a democratic transition, it is unrealistic to assume that parties will behave as unitary actors. And therefore, party competitions, competition is unlikely to tell the whole story. We need to look inside parties, we need to look at sub-party groups, and we need to look at how interest groups that somewhat feel threatened in the new regime, but were privileged in the previous regime, um, influence the choices of decision makers about what to do with a successor party. So why would pro-authoritarian groups that are, repeat the definition, where those groups that are, were privileged in the previous regime and feel threatened in the new regime, support a resurgent successor party? Well, generally, they would target the government with their request, because clearly th it's the government that can do something for them. However, as we know, if we have a party, if they have a party that is not, perhaps not very big, but relevant on the flank of the moderate coalition that they are mostly targeting with their request, well, they, are, they have a sort of insurance policy that that coalition will listen to them because otherwise they will switch their support to the successor party and the successor party itself will voice their concern, therefore pushing the moderate parties towards those policy positions. So it is, a, um, it is rational for pro-authoritarian groups to support a successor party, even though they know that the party will not be part of government, and of course, even more so if they think that the party might enter the government coalition. So um, these are the three propositions that I would like to test in my broader research. Obviously, testing this proposition is quite requires quite data-intensive um, research. One has to you know, look at different cases and look at the process, the decision-making process, look at the um, motivations of parties and the motivations of um, within party actors and interest groups and the connections between interest groups and parties and so on. So um, this is best done in the context of comparative case studies, which is what I'm doing in my broader uh, project. But I cannot do this in one paper today. Um, this is really the task for a broader research agenda on these issues. So really what I'm going to do today is to analyze one case in some depth, making sure that I ch choose the case that has what, as we say in comparative politics, I don't know how many comparative, pol political, uh, comparative politics people are in the audience today, um, as a high leverage. That is to say, that makes us somewhat confident that, it, that the same processes will um, be at play, will be operating also in a broader set of cases. And um, so let me tell you something on how I choose uh, the cases among the universe, from among the universe of um, post-authoritarian democracies to um, test this proposition. But first of all, my subset of cases is West European post-fascist democracies. Um, why is that? There's a strange gap in the political science literature there that some of you might be aware of. Um, first of all, much of the literature that I mentioned before on legal culture and on memory, although not all, but a lot of it, deals with Western Europe, post-fascist West European cases. Um, and so it seems a logical choice wanting to criticize that literature to look at the same cases, at least to start with. But second, there's a, the gap that I was mentioning before, that in the democratization literature, um, Scholars either look at the late 19th century, and you might think about, I don't know, the current debate on uh, why democracies chose PR instead of choosing or sticking with majoritarian systems, and that's all from the 1870s to the 1900s. Or the 
bulk of democratization studies is post-1970. And somehow these cases of post-1945 have been left out for reasons that are unclear to me. But it seems to me that these are quite important and interesting cases that can say quite a lot um, about how um, institutional choice in democratization works. And so I'm only addressing one specific institutional choice, but I think the importance of these cases is uh, more general and their potential for uh, the study of democratization is untapped or largely untapped. Second, I will, as I will show in a second, Italy is a hard case for the propositions that I'm putting forward, at least for the first two pathways. And let me show you why this is the case, and that's the reason uh, why I will concentrate on Italy in the second part of this talk. So these are the first, this is a summary of the first two pathways. As I said before, if you have a negotiated transition, the outcome will be a lenient policy. If you have a ruptured transition, when, well, the outcome will depend on whether the successor party threatens the majority or not. And this is how post-fascist West European democracies fit into this. So, um, as you can see, the last column tells you whether the um, expectations are confirmed by the cases. The case of Austria is mixed, it's undermined, uh, it's undetermined, sorry, because um, there was a grand coalition at the time between the socialists and the Catholic. Actually, the case of Austria that I looked at a little bit in more depth confirms um, this, this view quite a lot. If you look at how the uh, leniency towards <coughs> the successor party there came about. But let's, let's leave it undetermined <coughs> for now. Um, so as you can see, um, Italy is probably the most important exception to this. So there's an exception of the Netherlands, but we can talk about it, it's less important. Italy was one of the core fascist countries in Europe, but you know, it seems to not respond to at least the first two of these, of these propositions. And in fact, um, the high leverage of Italy vis-a-vis -vis this homogeneous set of countries, homogeneous in terms of past regimes, homogeneous in many cases in terms of uh, governing coalition, because almost all of these governing coalitions after World War II included somewhat, somehow a moderate center-right party that would be threatened or not, it uh, would be threatened by uh, the um, resurgence of a successor party. Where it wasn't threatened is just because these successor parties were too small. Um, so the, the, the study of Italy is interesting also because it allows us to come back to these cases with the finding that we have on, on Italy, especially uh, since that's what I'm going to concentrate on the third pathway, the pro-authoritarian groups. It allows us to focus on specific pro-authoritarian groups that were relevant in all of these cases. And these are the, land, the large landowners, the industrialists, and in some cases, the church, the Catholic church. So um, mm, if I were looking at uh, Latin American democracies, for example, well, the military would have to be included in, uh, uh, in these groups. But as we know, the military was not in uh, condition to do anything in Western Europe after World War II because of the defeat in the war. Um, in Eastern Europe, the constellation of these groups will be still different. So the general concept of pro-authoritarian groups is applicable to different areas. Which groups we look at in order to make more structural comparisons is tightly bound to the area and to the context that we look at. So. Um, to make matter wor matters worse, uh, if one looks at conventional views, Italy fits like a glove. <laughs> that is to say, um, from the point of your legal culture, uh, let me just read you a quote from an essay by two uh, important um, Italian constitutional lawyers published in 2009. In Italy, the very idea of political dissent, even that of successor neo-fascist parties, is disapproved of in political and constitutional discourse. So that's why they don't do it. Um, from the point of view of memory, 
Well, the main paradigm to, un to interpret the debate on memory in, uh, in Italy after 1945 is the so-called divided memory paradigm. What is divided memory? Well, divided memory is a public sphere in which the long governing Christian Democrats and their allies are seen as having a more ambiguous, let's say, relationship with the fascist past, while the left, especially the Communist Party that was for a long time in the opposition, uh, we're talking about almost half a century here, is instead seen as being the guardian of true anti-fascist memory. So you can see that, for example, in the different interpretation, in the different discourse of these two political forces about the anti-fascist resistance that developed in the north of the country at the end of the war, in the last year and a half of the war, um, for the um, PC, for the Communist Party, the resistance was um, a second risorgimento. It a, was a way, in, was the beginning of a new rebirth of the Italian, of the Italian um, uh, people. For um, the DC was a fight for freedom against all totalitarianisms, including, of course, not just fascists, but also uh, communism. So there was this divided sphere for a long time, and that, that comes up in any study of political memory that you read on, uh, on Italy. Um, so it looks again that since the forces that were in government for a long time, the Christian Democrats, held this ambiguous view of the past, that's why they did not implement this legislation against, they will not pass or implement the legislation against the uh, neo-fascist MSI, which was for a long time the strongest traditional neo-fascist party in Western Europe. So um, is it true, though, and I'm going to contest that in the rest of this, of this talk. Logically, the way to do this, that in, again, in comparative politics is called process tracing or systematic process analysis and all that. I don't want to talk methodological jargon today. Um, logically, the way to do this is to take the two rival explanations that I have put at the top of this slide, analyze the decision-making process, focusing on the key steps, of course, focusing on the decisive step of the processes, look at who the key actors were, and reconstruct the motivations of their actions. Were they normative, that is to say, were they driven by their uh, view of the fascist past, or were they driven by electoral incentives? And so this is what I'm going to do uh, in the rest of the, of the talk. Mm. But before that, uh, let me tell you the story of how it went, because you know, I've been making a lot of analytical points here. And sometimes comparative politics people also tell stories. So the events that we are looking at. First of all, um, the um, original fascist party was dissolved and destroyed in 1943, then reconstituted uh, in the north of Italy again, dissolved and destroyed in 1945. In 1946, some mid-ranking officers of that party reorganized, reconstituted a clearly successor party of the National Fascist Party that ruled Italy between 1925 and 1945 or 43, depending on what, what uh, you take as your last point. So they reorganized in 1946. They participated in elections in 1948. They only got 2%. But after that, they started reconstituting their organization through the country. The 1948 elections, as you uh, may know, returned a moderate government um, run by the Christian Democrats and including a, small, a couple of small parties as allies. There is very little doubt that the resurgent MSI, Movimento Sociale Italiano, which was a neo-fascist party, was perceived as a threat. We know that from party documents, we know from we know that from letters of, this, uh, of the party leaders, they were worried about this party. They were worried about the fact that this party would steal votes on the right flank to this governing coalition. And so um, 
especially in the south, obviously. Why in the south? Because in the north, as I mentioned before, there have been a civil war between the resistance and the, you know, the puppet regime propped up by the Nazis that was led by Mussolini for about a year and a half. But in the south, none of that actually happened. So the disruption of civil war had left the reputation, the, the lack of disruption of civil war rather, had left the reputation of um, uh, rightist forces less tarnished than it was in the north. Mm -hmm. And so there were local elections coming up in 1951 in which there would be um, about 7,000 towns um, would, would 7,000 town council would be elected and about 89 province council would be elected. And so this was sort of a big deal because that was the moment for the government coalition to, recon to really consolidate its grip on, on Italy. The first elections, local elections, had taken place immediately after the war. The party system was still fluid. Now they had a better grip on, at least at the national level, they really wanted to reconsolidate that at the local level. And so um, the MSI was clearly an obstacle for that. And so what the government did, first of all, they delayed local elections only in the South to 1952 so that they would have more time to act. Second, they passed a new local electoral law that um, gave the coalition that would get a plurality the majority of seats. Okay? So the plan was obviously to run as a cartel of the governing party, get a plurality, and therefore take over the whole town hall in all these towns and beat the left that was the main, the main um, enemy. A viable MSI on the right flank, obviously not, coal, not in coalition with the government party, would have endangered that view, therefore giving these councils to the left, and that's exactly what they wanted to, to avoid. So they propose a new law that would allow the government to suspend the MSI pending a judicial ruling. That was the plan. So um, the government writes a new bill in November 1950, uh, realized that probably in October 1950, by the end of November 1950, they have written the new bill approved it in cabinet, brought it to parliament, and requested the urgency procedure to approve it. Why the urgency procedure? Because Italy is a perfect bicameral system, so it takes forever to pass a law. It has to be approved by the committee and by the floor in the same form by both chambers, while the urgency procedure would shorten that, thereby giving the government the possibility of having the law in place before the election in the South was, uh, would be held. This attempt was defeated in Parliament, despite the bill was passed by the cabinet and therefore nominally at least had the uh, support of all the parties composing, supporting the coalition, uh, composing the coalition that supported the government. However, this didn't pass in Parliament. Um, when this happened, everybody knew that that project was dead. That is to say, there wasn't a majority for banning the MSI. This would go into the, you know, into the workings of the parliamentary procedure, and it would maybe be approved, but way too late, and perhaps, you know, wouldn't even be approved. But if it, if it was approved, it would be way too late for using the law against the MSI, and therefore the window of opportunity closes. So really, the key step of this process is this vote in Parliament. I should say it was very well known to everybody. It was all over the press for all the month of November in all newspapers what the meaning of this vote would be. So everybody knew exactly what they were doing. So um, what were the party alignments on this vote? These are the parties in Parliament. Just look at the top three lines. Um, I should say G after GOO after the name of the party simply means government or opposition. And the number is the number of seats in the Senate at the time where this vote took place. Um, 
I should say there is no roll call for this vote, unfortunately, but we can reconstruct how parties voted from uh, eyewitness accounts in the press and from party documents. So as you can see, um, the expectation that um, derive from the conventional view, that is to say, it's normative, right? It's the politics of memory that really drives, it's the lessons that the um, elites learn from the past that drive policy selection, doesn't seem to explain the position, at least of the main three parties. Uh, because the communists and the socialists that had a much more intransigent view of the fascist past, they were not trying, well, they were trying, but much less than the Christian Democrats, to attract supporters of the, of the old regimes, well, those are the ones that actually vote against the bill. And the Christian Democrats instead, the other way around. Uh, the small parties also, you know, the, it's mainly supported also for the small parties. But what I want to focus on is the real um, factor that killed the bill, that is to say the defections from within the ranks of the Christian Democrats. Because that, I mean, the opposition might vote against, but they are the opposition. They don't have a majority in government. So the same question of what motivated votes on, of single MPs uh, on this project can be asked um, as we asked it about parties. And this is what we can say. So if we look inside the Christian Democratic senator, senatorial group, this is what we find. Of course, we can reconstruct um, what they had in their mind uh, as what they thought about the fascist past. They're all dead, it's impossible to interview them. However, as a proxy, we can take from their biographies whether they had been active in the resistance in 1943 to 45, or whether they had been pushed out of politics in the early 20s when fascism took over. And as you can see, um, and assume that these are proxies for uh, they having, uh, let's say, intransigent view of the fascist past, they having no uh, desire to accommodate um, fascists. And as you can see, the vast majority of the senatorial group fell in these two categories. And by the way, this is robust to different classifications and different um, ways to, you know, to divide up the group. So it seems unlikely that normative view drove defections from within the Christian Democratic Party uh, in this decisive vote. But were they driven by electoral interests? And this is where pro-authoritarian interest groups come in the picture. So um, I'll say something about what these groups thought about whether the MSI should be kept in place or not. And I'll say something about whether these interest groups had the power, the influence, to um, sway a sufficient number of Christian Democratic senators at the right moment. So the Catholic Church, well, the position of the Vatican was very clear. The MSI not only should be left uh, alone and kept in place, but should be brought into government. Uh, this was expressed very clearly by high-ranking um, members of the Vatican hierarchy, like the Secretary of State and others. was expressed in the Vatican press or the Jesuit press. Um, why was that? Because the vision of the Pope and the, uh, of the Curia of Rome, that is to say the, the government of the Vatican, was simply that um, post-World War II was the moment for re-evangelizing Italy. That is to say, to form a Christian coalition between the Christian Democrats, the fascists, kick out the lay allies of the Christian Democrats that were in government with the Christian Democrats at the time, and start this op operation of re-evangelization. Sounds strange, but that's exactly what the Pope and the people around him believed at the time. So they tried everything they could 
to push the Christian Democrats towards an alliance with the MSI. Because that was the best way to fight the left, according to them. I should say at this stage that according to the Prime Minister De Gasperi and the other people that wanted to ban the MSI, they were certainly not at all pro-left. They just had a different view of what the best way to fight the left was, that is to say, strengthen the center, not move to the right. And by um, banning the MSI, that's what they wanted, to strengthen the center in order to be able to, wi to withstand the uh, push from the left, from the extreme left. Landowners, well, again, landowners were very um, privileged during fascism, and now they are threatened with land reform. And the Christian Democrats are dragging their feet, but they have to implement land reform because, especially in the South, there were more and more occupations, uh, episodes of occupation of land, generally led by the Communist Party. So land reform was in the pipeline. It was being about to be approved, and landowners did not like that. And if didn't, again, the Christian Democrats were very aware of that. If you read the memoirs of some of the leaders at the time, this comes out very clearly. Industrialists, I put them in parentheses because perhaps surprisingly, they are not in favor of the MSI. They're not in favor of keeping the MSI in. Why? Because after 1947, the government had very strong pro-industry policies. And the Industrialist Association after the summer of 1947 was totally behind the centrist leadership of the DC and the government. Um, in 19, at the end of 1947, they did have the possibility of supporting a party on the right flank of the Christian Democrats, the Uomo Qualunque, in a situation in which the government would have fallen if, they, if the Uomo Qualunque had voted against them. They did not do so. They actually put pressure on the Uomo Qualunque to support the government in that specific occasion, and then they cut funds <laughs> for the Uomo Qualunque that disappeared after a very, very little time. So the industrialists really, um, some industrialists did support the MSI, but these are really not very many and not very important. The Industrialist Association was behind the centrist leadership of the Christian Democrats at all times, and certainly was so in 1950. Um, so what I'm going to do next is to see how, whether the Catholic Church and the landowners could influence the vote of um, DC senators, Christian Democratic senators, by using a statistical model that simply collects, measures the influence of the Catholic Church and the landowners at the local level in the elections of the 1948 parliament, that is to say where these senators got their votes, and um, see whether there's an, there's an effect there, and there is an effect. You can ask me about the measures I, I used. If you're curious, you can ask me about the nature of this data. I don't want to bore you with technicalities, but please feel free to, to ask questions. There's a bunch of controls from the third line downwards that you could ask me about, but what I would like you to concentrate on, on are the first two lines. Um, those coefficients, for those of you who are not familiar with this, simply means that the territorial penetration of the church and the structural local of uh, rural ownership at the local level were quite important factors for Christian Democratic senators to keep in mind when they were voting pro or against these groups' preferences. So this evidence, together with historical evidence that I in part have mentioned and in part discussed more at length in the paper, uh, show that Really, it, it looks like these groups had quite some influence on the belly of the Christian Democratic Party to such an extent that they could have their way in a decisive moment in which these policies between, um, uh, towards successful parties, like a successful party like the MSI, were being implemented. Um, so, um, to conclude on this first point, and then I'll move to my second point very briefly, it doesn't seem to be the case 
that normative inclination towards the past have driven the selection of policy in the Italian case. It seems to be the case instead that electoral incentives did, both for the logic of the party competition and for the logic of the influence of important pro-authoritarian interest groups on sub-party circle, within party circles. At the beginning of this talk, I said I would make two points on this. And the second point, as you might remember from my um, slide with the two arrows, was that not only memory was not the cause of policy, but it could be the other way around, that at least the choice of certain policies uh, towards successive parties was um, to be, um, what should be seen as important for setting at least the debate on the memory of the authoritarian past on certain tracks. And um, so my next slide is really about this. It's about the endogeneity of this memory debate. The point here is simply this, that we cannot see this interpretive feedback effect, as the literature calls them. That is to say, the effect that the approbation, the, the, the enactment of a certain policy has on how political actors and citizens and groups see the political world and therefore change their, their um, uh, inclination and their preferences. We cannot see this kind of feedback effect in isolation from other feedback effects that have to do with resources and most of all with incentives. So let me go through the first two first. Resources, that, that's very simple. As I said before, once it's clear that there isn't a majority for uh, illegalizing the MSI, that very quickly becomes unfeasible. The law is eventually approved, but after, in the middle of 1952, after the MSI got more than 11% of uh, the vote in the whole south of Italy. In 1953, it would then go on to obtain almost 6% nationally. At that stage, even if you have a law, it's impossible to implement that law. Um, incentives, this is the more interesting, perhaps, part of this. That is to say, the MSI, already in 1952, is in coalition with the Christian Democrats in the government of some southern, southern cities. Why is that? Because and uh, there's more than that, there's more to that that I, that I uh, will talk about in a second. Because once the MSI is there, and it has a parliamentary strength, both at the national and the local level, well, the incentives of the mainstream parties of the center-right, of course, in public, is to repudiate any alliance with the MSI, but in de facto, is to use the MSI for tacit deals that would allow them to beat the left. And for example, this happened certainly at, lo at the local level, where the alliance of the DC with the MSI was formally banned by the party headquarters, but nevertheless happened in cities like Naples, not exactly like small villages. And, um, but most importantly, it happens at the national level. For example, the Italian president of the republic needs a supermajority to be elected. Well, already in 1955, that is to say the second president of the republic was elected with the support of the MSI. Um, already in 1957, the government, DC-led government, sought support, external support, tacit support, of the MSI. So um, clearly, the incentives change. Um, also, these changes in incentives lead, to, lead the government to do the two things that I put on the slide there. First of all, there has been a debate on whether the, the MSI should be banned or should not be banned. And of course, normative principles were evoked on either side. Well, we should ban them because they um, represent the evil of the past. Or no, we should not ban them because it's illiberal to ban a party. So when the government at the end has to fall one way because there's no other option, well, the government has to say explicitly well, um, of course, every party has to be treated in the same way. Now, interestingly, the guy that says that, the prime minister at the time, was the same minister of interior affairs that drafted the bill to ban the MSI. So it's unlikely that his normative views have changed. Actually, what changed was 
the situation around them. Second, and perhaps more importantly, more directly relevant for the debate on memory, is that the government tolerates acts of public rehabilitation of the fascist regime. That is to say, tolerate a public presence of positive views of, fascist, of the fascist regime. Um, let me just read the, um, the, the quote from the MSI party newspaper in 1958 after the MSI in 1957 um, supported a DC-led government. The, the DC allowed the MSI to rebury Mussolini in his natal town in 1957. In 1958, the MSI party newspaper titled The Post War Is Over. <laughs> so, um, the post war era is over. To this day, the um, tomb of Mussolini remains a sort of place for um, you know, meetings of uh, nostalgic um, supporters of the, of the fascist regime. So, um, Obviously, as I say, I won't talk about the long run today, but I hope that shows that already these things set the debate on certain tracks that then have a longer lasting influence. So to summarize, this is what I said today. Um, it's really the strategic concerns of mainstream actors that lead to policy selections. This leads to uh, or influences public norm and then in the broader project, I uh, will look at this reciprocal causation down there on the stream right of the, of the slide. So what does, all, what does do that, that all mean? Of course, there are open questions. What's the connection between this and other forms of success or dissent, for example, on expression or assembly or all that? What does it mean to allow or not allow a political party of a certain ideology for these other forms of successor participation? And also how feedback effects actually work in the long run. I think this is quite an under-theorized part in, uh, in the study of institutions. But let me say something really to conclude um, about the implications. First, the first implication is how we study this thing. It's on how we study these things. But last night in my hotel here, I saw a lecture by William Sewell given in this center. Um, and he was talking about, it was fascinating as usual, and he was talking about different temporalities. That is to say, the temporality of economic change and social change was different, is different, is wave-like, uh, than the temporalities of politics that are instead much more punctuated and much more um, uh, short-term in a certain sense. Well, um, in the study of democratization that I see this work as part of, we should try to really address both. And uh, obviously, the social structure, the socioeconomic foundations of uh, political change are very important. But we should always remember that, by definition, as different kinds of institutions and policies are compatible with the same socioeconomic constellation. This is part, really, of the definition of institutions, or at least the definition of institutions that most of us work with. So. Um, Every social structural constellation has allows a range of policies and, institutional, and institutions. And this range is not always totally indifferent. In some cases it is, but some cases like this one is not. And I come to the second point that has to do with the implication for the study of democracy. That is to say, policies of, of inclusion or exclusion of a certain party really define what democracy is about, or define the type of democracy, define whether democracy is more or less liberal, is more or less tolerant, is more or less inclusive, you choose the adjective. So it seems that in order to understand how these different definitions of the boundaries of participation come about, we do need to look at the social structure, of course, and I have done so, but we do need to look at the social structure in the context of institutional choice. and that might lead to different results in different countries just because the temporality of politics is different in different countries or might be different in different countries might change most more rapidly while the underlies, underlying social um, social socioeconomic structure might change less rapidly 
Um, last point is about the politics of memory. Um, in the um, famous novel 1984, Orwell, George Orwell says, who controls the past controls the future, and who controls the present controls the past. Now, obviously, in a democracy, nobody fully controls the present or the past or the future, but it is true that the debate on memory is not totally free-floating. It is structured. It is structured, we can say, over space, across space, because different, the, the public sphere might be shaped in a different way in different countries. And it's structured over time. That is to say, different shapes of the public sphere might lead, might allow different forms on in, of intertemporal change of the debate on memory. And so uh, my contention is obviously that we need much more theory to understand how this works in democracy. But really, the point I'm making here on this specific aspect is that we need to look at the moment in which this difficult past of post-authoritarian democracy, democracies first became past. That is to say, at the aftermath, when things are set on a certain track. On that note, I'll conclude, and I'll thank you for your attention. Thanks.